They didn't have stage presence. They didn't know how to talk to the crowd in between the records. And so Luke is, um, you know, he's out there on the road with us, um, you know, as the manager of everything. And he's seeing that we dying on stage. So, mm. you know, the one thing Luke did do, he was, you know, the ghetto style DJs was the name of their um, DJ group, just like how Uncle Jan's Army was. So he, they do a different type of DJing in Florida. They'll, you know, they'll pull the music down and talk over the records and all that old school DJing. So that's what he comes from. So what he did, start doing the stuff that he would do as a DJ on stage to keep um, the people hyped up. And, you know, he would say stuff in between the stuff before their rap parts would come up. So mm. that ended up working out. And then, you know, when I was doing my scratch show and all of that, he would tell them, off, yeah, he's going to go behind his back and then he's going to do, he was Ringling Brothers. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He was, a, he was a circuit master. He was he was conducting the whole fucking show, nigga. Right, right. So that's yeah, how. He, so, but but, this, but so, the funniest thing about it, though, still, he did it a couple of times, right? And mm -hmm. then you know we go down into the office. He hot about shit, you know. And said, man, um, uh, you know, said, man, I ain't gonna be going out on that stage doing this shit and not getting paid, for, man. I got to get paid for my. What it is that I'm mm. doing, I got to get paid. All the money's coming to him already anyway. So right. now he want to cut. Now he want to cut. He want to cut now. He want to cut of what he giving us on right. top of whatever it is that he could be skimming. I'm already taking the cut, and now I want to cut of that because now y'all got me on stage too. So <laughs> not only do I want my manager cut, I want my member cut because I'm a part of the show. Yeah, right. I'm double, I'm double dipping around this bitch. <laughs> and so, and so, y'all doing these shows, and he's a part of the show now, and everything. Y'all doing y'all thing. When does it come up that y'all will release this first album? Um, it it came out um at the top of '87. Throw the D came out like in um uh, like February '86. We worked all through the you know um without having a, another single or anything like that until 87 but there was other little groups that um you know like shy d's um project came out and uh um, yeah, we used to bang i used to bang some shy d yeah shy um, d we, sure. and him worked on the first record that he did gotta be tough record we worked on that mm -hmm. together there was a couple of other little records that was coming out that was kind of pacifying the scenario but we only had that one single so as we're working along you know, getting the getting the album ready and together. Um, the We Want Some Pussy song basically was a, a a DJ chant they used to say in the club. And that was, that's the only record Luke is on on the first album. Like I said, he wasn't in it that way. You know, it was just me, Marquise, and Chris that was doing the, um, the stuff on the records. It was just that one thing that he was on. So and you know by you being down there, a dude from California, you pretty much created the sound for the South at that time, right? Exactly. There was um, there was got there was cats. You know, I didn't even realize this until maybe like four or five months ago. There was a couple of records that was you know that was around town that was being played, but I just really just thought about it. It was the same drum pattern as the record that mm -hmm. that got us down there the first time. I wasn't even thinking about it. it was, other stuff was on top of it, but the but the but the drum pattern was the same. I said, ain't this a mm. bitch? This record was super big out there, and people was copying what we was doing. They didn't realize we, they was copying. That's why McCullough gave you the fifteen hundred to do the album because they said we go get him for some more, man. We go get the whole album out of him this time. Yeah, we got on, the man, first please. one for free. This one gonna cost us fifteen hundred. Yeah, fifteen hundred, nigga. Here you go. <laughs> so y'all doing y'all thing, Hobbs? Right? Y'all y'all doing y'all? When y'all hear me call him Hobbs, that's his. I shouldn't be calling you by your government now. No, okay. So I call you Hobbs yeah. anymore. But um, you haven't been calling me that for years. So I mean, you know. So y'all doing y'all thing, no right? Y'all doing y'all thing. At any point, did Luke ever come to y'all and say, "Hey, Mister Mix, you go be the A and R. I'm starting Luke Records up. Here's a contract for y'all. Never the, the contract never was signed. Well, this is what happened. Like I say, we fall into the management thing with him. Nope, we're all just kind of like 
improv it. You know what I'm saying? He started the um, record company stuff up based off of the fact that nobody would take the throw the D record. So he said, okay, look, man, um, I want to give you guys shares in the company. I said, man, I don't want no shares in no company. I don't know shit about business. All I want to do is just do my part with making these records, making this music, and if you can do that, I'm good. I'm cool. Just pay me for what it is that that we do on these records and that's it. that's it. I don't I don't want to be responsible or liable for something that I don't know shit about. I don't have no clue of what it is that's going on with this stuff. So he offered all three of us, me, Mark, and Chris, some money as as a as, you know shareholders of the record company. It just was too green to understand what it was that he was really coming at us with. And but but with that being said. We were just dealing with each other as independent contractors. We didn't have no contract amongst each other at all, period. We weren't even signed. Mm. Mm. So we making the records. I go in and make the records, Mark and Chris be on the records rapping. You take the records and, and start selling them. <laughs> so y'all doing your thing now. When did the big record deal start coming in? Like when did the big distributors? I know he was selling, he was making millions of dollars selling these records independently. Yeah, you know, but the thing the is, the first album like, went gold. If I'm if I'm not mistaken, the first yeah, album, two albums, we got went gold. Right? Gold, it took like maybe he would, you know, in those days it was so funny. You didn't have to give up the amount of records that you sold unless you just wanted to get that gold certification. You could keep that part a secret. A motherfucker would have to audit you to find out if that's really what it was that you did. And so he would always dismiss the fact of. The record went gold because you know once you say it went did five hundred thousand now everybody we think okay well there's a gang of money there this that, and the third so he was you know tap dancing around that but at the same time um there was uh other little record people that he was meeting i remember we had got um we had did something for um uh we did something for twins movie soundtrack that was like maybe like a year later but he would get all kind of little offshoot deals that, you know, that I know that, you know, he got paid for them. Never really told us that he was getting paid for those things. He would just say, hey, man, there's a, a record that we got to do. And we did it. You know what I'm saying? Nobody was really stunting it because everybody was living okay. Nobody was really in struggle. Well, he made sure y'all had money in your pocket. Y'all had cars sure and cars and stuff. We had, he didn't make sure that we had money in our pocket. It was just things was going and it was deservedly so that we would get the money for what we did. I'll put it that way. It wasn't like, you know, um, you know, he'd knock on my door and say, ah, hey, Ives, I got some money for you. No, it was, um, we did the show, we break bread after the show, and, and everybody went their own individual way. Well, that show money, I'm talking about the records and stuff. You're supposed to get, like, if they go on the road, you know, he get paid for the show. But yeah, I mean, no the record, we don't be it. That's a whole nother thing. It. You got to think about it at that time, you know, you're dealing with the distributors and you're on maybe 60 day terms, 90 day terms for the records that you're being invoiced out. So he was getting money from the standpoint that the records were selling through fast, but he wasn't really displaying the fact that, you know, in order to um, keep making um, the records, you have to get paid for the um in order for you to get paid for the records that they had at the distributor, you had to have a new one to make them break bread with you. And we didn't have an understanding that that's what. Yeah, because, was. you know, I used to work with ground level. You remember that, right? So the way the distributors worked back then was they would have what was called a reserve. They might hold 20% right. of reserve because records can come back from the store. You might have returns, right? right? So they had the, the reserve just in case. So with the distributor, like, okay, they have freedom reserves up if you give a new album. Okay, give me a new right. album, and I'm going to free these reserves up for you. Because I'm going to tell you now, he probably was seeing about six fifty a record back then. Let me see. Yeah, but, yeah but, but the six fifty yeah, is, you know, you got to think you about it. Yeah, I did. I moved you my people up. That's where I learned the game from. Huh? Nigga, them motherfuckers was shysty as a motherfucker. <laughs> Bro, they wasn't that bad, man. But, <laughs> but I didn't, ground level was bad, nigga. Like, we had a record went through ground level, so you knew, did. you knew you knew John Smith. John brought a record through uh, ground level. 
John, John, um, was, John, they had a, they had a label called Native. Native oh, I Records. remember Native. I didn't have nothing Native. to do with Native. Native had a record Native going through there. Was, no, what it was, Native though. Was, yeah. <laughs> I knew about Native. I knew about Native. <laughs> Native was my motherfucking uh, attorney and manager. They had started a label and they called it Native. Yeah, I put a we put a record through ground level, a CMW record. That's crazy, man. Because you know he probably made about three or four million dollars Hobbs off that first album. Yeah, yeah I'm no, talking. This is the thing. This is the this thing that. Them niggas was shy. Y'all, y'all was getting that money, nigga. Y'all was getting that. I, money. Hold on, let me get it straight. No, I didn't have no ownership in them. They, they kind of like I did intern work for them. You know, I was a young dude at yeah. the time. I did intern work like for what them. That, I didn't what, have what, was no ownership them. what was their office at? Still, um, it was um in Inglewood, Ingle right up right by the airport, right off the airport, mm-hmm. right off La Cienega, right off the four or five freeway. Yeah. You can see it in the black building. Yeah, OG black ground building, level. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What happened to him? <laughs> Man, you know what? They wound up just letting it go, dog. They had a lot of records. They had hieroglyphics. They had a lot of people. Mac Dre. They had a gang of workers. Like I, I know because, like I said, my my shiesty attorney in them. They had started. No, natives. I think what it was was natives might have been shiesty, dog. But ground level pretty much paid people, dog, when they had to. The ground level paid broke bread. Mark and them was good cats. Mark, um, it was Mark. Jeff and Rick Holcutt, a white dude, they was cool people, dog. Uh-huh. Yeah, they paid okay. when they were supposed to. Now, them, now whatever label that was, that was up there, now what would happen is usually the labels would get that check and decide, well, man, I ain't, I ain't, I ain't cutting up I with this man. ground level. I ain't take the claims. Shit. Oh yeah, definitely. They did some shit. So, mix what I'm trying to get to. I'm trying to get to what trickery come in at, right? Mm-hmm. So y'all doing these albums? He making money. What is he doing? Just giving y'all show money? Well, we were getting show money and we was getting royalties, but we didn't know how to base the royalties. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. We didn't, we didn't, we, there was never no contract. So we didn't have anything to base it off of. We was just getting money based off of, okay, we, you know, four or five months passed by. Okay, we're going to throw up some money. And then, but you got to think about it. It's three of us. So if he want to give out 150 grand, so it's you know 50, 50, 50, and then that's that. But we don't, we're not basing it off of, you know, we're not getting no um no layouts of what it and is. Really, you producing the record, so you could have been on some stuff like you know what I need my production money. I need you know. Did not tell you yeah, I was basically, crazy. Basically, basically, they was doing the game like, okay. Niggas probably making a million, two million. And so to satisfy, I'm not gonna give y'all no reporting of how many records that was pressed or how many was right. shipped or whatever. What I'm just gonna do is is I got a check for a million dollars, and these niggas don't know shit. You get me? Yeah, these niggas a couple hundred. What I'm gonna do is, and let's just face it, it's fucked up. But when you a hungry motherfucker and a nigga dangling a hundred and fifty thousand in your face, you like give it here, man. You and and you young, and you young as fuck. You got to think about how old young we were. Young, right? young and naive, and like I said, we didn't know much about the rap game. We knew how to make the music. We knew how to write the lyrics and shit. And we, you know, as who we are as these artists, but. Nigga, you, I didn't know nothing about no publishing contract. I didn't know nothing about writers and 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 fifty percent to the to the to the music maker and a hundred writers, a hundred public. I, I didn't know none of that shit. All I right. knew is I want to make a record, right? And maybe exactly. getting a couple of maybe getting a couple of magazines, nigga, a couple of limo rides, a couple of shows. That's what you thought being an artist was. Nobody right. sat you down in the motherfucking uh nobody sat you down in, in music 101. You get me and said, okay, well, do you know anything about publishing? Do you know about writers? Do you know about royalties and all right. this and all this? 
counting and how many records were pressed and shipped out, how many returns came back. You didn't know none right. of that shit. Well, right. you know and, so, and so you don't get the knowledge to do that. A nigga go, here you go. You get me? And so to speak, let me distract you with this shiny gold chain or watch or this check. And you be like, like you said, as a young nigga, 19, 20, 21, back then, a nigga handing you 50 grand? Right. Oh, nigga, please. You got to remember, and see, you got to think too, um, hey, I learned pretty much about the music industry from Mr. Mix. I met the Hobbs when I was 24. Uh-huh. And mm-hmm. he started that explaining, <laughs> yeah, I was that young, dog. Yeah, we been messing with each other about 30 something years already, dog. Me and Skip was 24 old, years old. You're the oldest motherfucker right now. You, you Hell see, yeah. said this. Hell yeah, because you got to remember, Hobbs, that's why we had kind of like an advantage because you had kind of taught us already to publish and is like a piece of pie. So I kind of yeah. knew already any situation I walked into, I knew what was going on because. Between him and Bobcat, they had already kind of schooled me on what was going on about the business of music. And then you got to remember, I had friends, like I had cats like Mark Gordon on ground level. So I knew how to sell the records. I knew how all that stuff worked already, you know? So it was like, you wasn't getting over on me with no shiesty shit. Yeah, well, the thing the thing of it is, at that time, though, I mean, at the time when I heard um, H First Num Project, I don't know how early you guys were doing stuff, but... I know that I, I was that was like 1990, like the summer of 90 when I heard one time gaffing them up. I don't know if that was y'all first record, but that's when I was made aware that you guys existed. So at that time, at the time that he I'm hearing this record, we're already four albums in. Four albums at that time, 1990, we was four albums in already. And the niggas still don't really have a real clue because nobody wanted to be the cat that was tapping you on the shoulder. And on top of that, would you believe them? <laughs> you wouldn't even give them a motherfucker the time of day because the money that you're running across as a young black dude, moving around in Benzes and doing this nice homes. And then you're hearing the horror stories about guys in New York, they ain't making no money, they fucked up, and but you're I living know. good. You know, who's gonna question the scenario? Mm-hmm. 